Stock markets around the world are more volatile than usual last Friday because of something called triple witching when contracts on stock market index futures, stock market index options and stock options all expire at the same time. But who outside the City of London even knows that? All the public seems to know is that because of losses incurred in the city, every aspect of UK life has been changing as austerity rips up the social fabric of the United Kingdom. But one investigative reporter wanted to find out more about the city and what makes it tick. Joris Lerendek is the author of the international bestseller Swimming with Sharks, My Journey into the World of the Bankers, and he joins me now. When everyone else was watching the Lehman collapse in 2008, what we didn't know is that the people, the kinds of people you yeah. talked to were preparing to stock up on guns and food yeah. from the supermarkets. Yeah, because I, I, I was a complete outsider. I knew nothing about finance. Um, and so I, I watched the whole Lehman collapse in 2008 as a big story, you know, you, the way you watch Ukraine or Syria or something. But now I meet these bankers and they tell me, actually, you know, we're so terrified. We thought civil war was about to break out. They were indeed uh, calling home saying, prepare the children for evacuation or buy gold, buy food. Because if we can no longer get to our money, but the financial sector collapses and so supplies to supermarkets stop and petrol stations stop and pharmacies stop and we all hear this at the same time, then what you get is not something with a happy ending. And this is what the insiders were terrified of. Finance is far more dangerous, I think, than almost everyone realizes, but it explains how um, it can sometimes, especially in continental Europe, take months for a government to form. And they maybe the difference are a few billion, but then a bank threatens to collapse, and within a weekend they have 30 billion. So how can there suddenly be money for banks when there can't be money for art or for uh, social welfare? And it's because when banks start to collapse, our entire economy will collapse with it. You quote Andrew Haldane, the Bank of England man, saying that there are holes, blacker than black holes, in the banks at the moment. Yep, the big balances banks. of banks. It was Haldane very quick to uh, criticize Corbyn uh, right from the outset, saying, no, 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 his ideas about restructuring regulation, they won't work. It's, it's really, okay, one of the problems is that uh, it's not only that we need a plan to, to change the financial landscape, uh, it, it's, it's also how to get there. So it's like Israel and the Palestinians. Everybody, every reasonable person knows what the solution is, a two-state solution. But the roadmap, how do we get there? As soon as you make one step, somebody blows someone else up and the whole system is in tatters. The same with finance. We know what we have to do. We have to break up the bank so they, have, they can comp they compete again, which will force down bonuses, that they can go bust again so they can't blackmail us. They should be simpler so we know what we buy when we buy a share in a bank. Um, and they, the, all sorts of uh, internal conflicts of interest should be eliminated. It's not rocket science, but if Britain is the only one to do this, then JP Morgan comes along and buys a little bit a small bank and then Credit Suisse comes along, tung, tung, tung. We're back where we start. England loses or the UK loses its financial sector, but globally nothing changes. And if the thing comes crashing down again, the UK will be sucked along with it. So the problem is finance operates globally and they can play off countries against each other because countries are organized on a national level. And so it's not only where do we want to go, but how do we get there? And that is immensely difficult. This is a problem of globalization. Well, surely nationalization, which is now on the agenda, would stop all the corruption as you talk about big four accounting firms, ratings agencies, the, the mess and, and the short termism of human resources. Uh, do you think the risks are now just too high? Because as you say, it would lead to the end of, end of society as we'd know it if someone's making a mistake right now just a few miles from the studio. Yeah, I think the, the, the trouble is that they've interviewed big corporates whether they would want to see the banks broken up because the, the corporates are just as much under threat as we are if the whole thing comes crashing down. But all of them say, look, we operate in 130 countries and so we want a bank that operates in 130 countries. Now, if you have a bank that operates in 130 countries, you need an accountancy firm that also operates in 130 countries to audit that bank. Now, there will be only few, uh, three or four accounting firms. And so you, what you have is these through globalization, scale has simply outstripped and outgrown the ability of governments to regulate because it just seeps out. And so we're dealing with this system that is inherently stable, instable. We've seen it in 2008, we've seen it again with Greece. We, we had to bail out Greece because otherwise the banks would fail. They had borrowed, to lend too much to Greece. Uh, we know this system will at some point collapse on us and we don't know what to do to prevent it. And so we're in this big financial prisoner's dilemma essentially. And we keep on focusing on bankers as greedy, evil, psychopath, coke snorting, whoring. And what we should focus on is the system itself. The incentives are all wrong. We need a different system and then we will get nicer bankers. I promise. Joris, thank you. In the best of the rest of the news, the left-wing Syriza party in Greece won its second general election in less than nine months. 
over the weekend. The election on Sunday was a snap election that was called after Cyprus lost a majority in August. And even though voter turnout was low, Syriza managed to win over 35% of the vote, which combined with the Independent Greeks party still gives a coalition a majority of their seats. Syriza's total support was slightly lower than when it won its initial victory in January. The low vote, voter turnout and the fact that Syriza lost some support is evidence that the Greek people are unhappy with the austerity terms that Syriza was forced to accept from the IMF and the European Union. That auster those austerity ter terms included pension cuts, increases in taxes, and the privatization of key infrastructures such as ports and railways. Meanwhile, the right-wing Nationalist Party Golden Dawn came in third in the polls with 7% which marks a slight increase in support for that far-right party since January. And even as Greece is forced to accept and cope with the terms of austerity, the country and the rest of Europe are dealing with a refugee crisis of unprecedented scale. So what can we make of the outcome of Sunday's election in Greece? And what can we expect from Europe's economies in the midst of the current refugee crisis? Here now to discuss the Greek elections and the European economy is Professor Richard Wolff, economist and professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and author of Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Glad to be here. It is always great to see you. First, what do you make of the outcome of the Greek elections yesterday? Is this really an endorsement of Cyprus's party or is this just a rejection of the other parties? I think it's mostly a rejection of the other parties I think what's so remarkable about Greece and what even speaks to us here in the United States is that the two traditional parties, the equivalents in Greece of the Republicans and the Democrats, New Democracy and the PASOK it's called in Greece, who had exchanged prime ministers and basically governed the country together like our two major parties, are now very much relegated to the margins. It's a wonderful lesson in how the parties that become fixed and settled and arrogant as if they're always in charge can, when they really mess up, be pushed out by voters. That's what the Greeks have done since 2012. That's what this last Sunday's election showed. They don't want to see those people back anytime soon. They pushed them out and they're going to stay with a clearly left-wing government that they turn to in their difficulty. Having said that, it's clear, and by the way, uh, Mr. Tsipras says this, that they are in terrible economic shape, that the conditions imposed on them by Germany above all, but by Europe in general, make it impossible for them to be able to get out of the mess they're in. So they're kind of treading water while everyone waits for some miracle to happen that'll solve the problem. And they're not getting a miracle, they're getting this refugee crisis, which, if imaginable, makes matters worse. And, and, and is driving, it seems, some of the right-wing parties, not just in, in uh, Greece, but now in Germany. We're seeing the, the, the rise of right-wing groups. Uh, are you expecting to see more of this across Europe? And, and do you think that the refugee crisis is going to have a significant impact on European politics and economics, in addition to boosting these right-wing nationalist parties? Uh, I guess the answer I would give you is yes and yes. I think we're going to see more of it. And I think that the uh, immigration crisis is going to fuel that kind of thing. And, and let me explain why. When European countries engage in a kind of economic development, as they call it, that makes Europe wealthy and rich, and this has been going on for decades, while it makes the areas near Europe, North Africa, Middle East, and so on, very poor, it is not a genius to figure out that sooner or later you're creating a growing incentive for people in a region that is poor and that stays poor to move, at least large numbers of people if they're mobile, to the area where there are jobs and there is a possibility uh, to do better. If you don't want to have a refugee crisis, you can't allow yourself basically to take the wealth of other parts of the world, bring it to your part, and imagine that no other consequences uh, will flow. If you add to that, making war in these countries, and let's be real clear, the flood of refugees into Europe comes from Syria, 
Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan, all places where Europe and the United States have engaged in all manner of military destructive interventions in the civil wars there, in upsurges against sitting governments. And if you add to poverty the catastrophe of war, then of course people will run for their lives as they always have. And now you're seeing Europe confronted with a consequence of its own decisions, long run and short run, but pretending that this is some sort of external problem of which they are the victims. It's a little bit disgusting. Mm. The last part of it, though, is that Europe is in trouble. Europe has its own problems lingering from the great crash of 2008. An army of poor people desperate for jobs who will work at lower pay, who will live in ghettos because it's better than being bombed in Syria, etc. They are going to make the conditions for working people in Germany or France or Italy or wherever they go more difficult. And just as the European leadership doesn't take responsibility for having caused the refugee crisis, now they want to act as though they don't have any responsibility to their own people to live with the consequences of a refugee influx. And you're going to see right-wing parties take advantage of this, take advantage of the failure of their governments, the arrogance and insensitivity, and move forward. And it'll be a race between the left wing, like Syriza, and the right wing, like Golden Dawn, and their parallels elsewhere to see who can cash in the most on the disaffection of growing numbers of people in in Europe as this unfolds. Yeah, much as we saw in the in the wake of World War One and then the the, 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 the great crash. Um, you mentioned you know these poor countries, um, particularly surrounding Europe. Uh, there sometimes these markets are referred to as emerging markets. These smaller countries. Um, there was a recent article in the Financial Times about how capital is fleeing from emerging markets, uh, investment capital and, and existing capital. Um, what do you see as the main cause of that, and does this anticipate a larger crash in the worldwide financial system? It, it looked to me pretty startling. It's like it's something, something like half the countries in the world are in major capital flight right now. Yeah, again, you know, for those of us that are economists, watching this process is amazing and when you realize that we've seen all this before and we ought to have learned some lessons. When capitalism as a global system crashed in 2008, you began a process in which the best off countries use their wealth, I'm talking about the United States and Western Europe and Japan, to push the burden of the crisis they created onto the countries that are poorer, weaker, less strong economies. It's sort of a kick it down the road, but kick it down the economic development right. ladder. So two or three or four years later, it's a crisis in China and India and Africa and Asia, all very predictable. But yes, you're now seeing these economies in a tailspin Nobody wants to invest there because who knows where that will end. That makes their problem worse. That makes it more likely that their problems will become the problems of Europe and North America through refugees, through the inability of those parts of the world to buy the products made here and so on. You're seeing the playing out of the ramifications of an economic crisis that is far from over and that continues to plague us by the kind of backwash of all the damage we pushed onto the third world, and they now push it back. That sounds like really bad news. I, I, I would love yes. to dig into that a whole lot deeper. We'll have to do it next time we talk. Professor Richard, Richard Wolf, it is always an honor and a pleasure to have you on this program. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you.